Okay, uh, if you're seeing this, you should be seeing a um, greenish colored screen that says Uniform Commercial Code Article 2 Sales of Goods. What you're looking at is um, a window on my uh, desktop uh, computer. It's a Mac at home, and I'm recording this using a program called iShowU, which not only records um, whatever's happening on my screen, but also records my voice um, as I'm going through this. You may see my mouse cursor like this kind of come onto the screen here. Um, don't freak out. It's not your computer. It's me kind of moving the cursor around. Um, so I've never done anything like this before. It's sort of a first time, and it's a little bit awkward. I'm actually sitting uh, in my house wearing the clothes I woke up in um, with a cup of coffee, and um, my my wife and my three-month-old daughter are here, so if you hear her screaming, um, you know, that's just pretty much the norm around here with a kid that age. I also have two dogs who may come uh, running into the room at any given time, and I'm going to try to keep this uninterrupted and just um, just go with it. So you may hear some ambient sounds of what it's like to be at my house. Um, also, I'm used, I've am used. i used uh, a Mac program called Keynote to make this um, what we would normally call a PowerPoint presentation, but I didn't use PowerPoint, I used Keynote. And like I said, the I Show You is a um, is another uh, Mac program um, that I'm using to record it and present it. Um, okay, a couple pre-lecture notes to mention on, uh, on how this is going to work. Um, I have an outline um, posted to Blackboard in a PDF format. The purpose of that is so that you can follow along. Um, it's, I find it extremely difficult to follow PowerPoint presentations. I don't like them. I'm not a fan. You've noticed already I don't use them in class. Um, but it seems like it's the best way to present the material here since you can't see me and I don't have a blackboard or whiteboard to work with. So um, you can use that to kind of get the big picture um, and to see where we are in the material and how we're moving through it. Um, Hopefully, um, to be honest, I'm not sure how long this is going to take. I'm hope, hoping um, not not too long because I imagine it's why you might be comfortable sitting in your homes or sitting in a library listening to this. Um, I imagine it's probably also a little bit weird. So um, I want to get through it quickly, um, and that should help you so that you don't kind of lose track. You obviously have the ability to pause and rewind things so you can hear it again. Um, and I'm going to try to be as clear as possible and also to go slowly to allow you some time to take notes. Um, I encourage you to take notes during this. You'll notice that the outline that I've presented is, is only about a page and a half. Um, so it's pretty bare bones on um, just a roadmap on roughly where we're going to be. Um, so if you need to pause this, grab a notebook or something, I encourage you to do that. Um, there's going to be a lot more in this presentation, um, obviously, than just what's in the outline. Um, the other part of this that's really missing compared with our um, in-class meetings is that you don't have the opportunity to um, ask me questions about the material. Um, the best I can do for that is to uh, create a form in the discussion board on our Blackboard page um, on this material. Um, I encourage you, if, if I've said something in here that doesn't make sense to you or you have a question, um, which, as you know, I you know, always comes up in class, and I, I'm, I'm going to miss that um, in this format. So if there is something, pause the lecture go to the Blackboard page, post your question before you lose it, or at very least write it down in the margin of your notes somewhere so that you can post it later. Um, I really do want to interact in this material. I feel like that's the best way for you to, to learn it, so um, please take advantage. Um, I will also post in Blackboard some questions of my own on the material um, to kind of challenge you. Um, I'd like everybody to at least review them. You don't have to comment. I'm not grading you know, whether or not you're participating in that respect. Um, but I think it'll be it'll be helpful to you to kind of get into some of the more complicated aspects of this material, which, as you know by now, has kind of been my um, one of my teaching tools um, throughout the semester is kind of present you some of the more complicated things that make you think about this material on a little bit deeper of a level. 
Okay, so with that in mind, uh, I'd like to get started here. The first thing that we need to address, um, these are the topics that we're going to cover. This is sort of you know where we're going. Um, these are the six things we're going to cover in this in this lecture. We're going to go into an introduction, and we're going to talk about formation of sales contracts, finding the terms of the agreement, performing, delivery and risk of loss, and lastly, warranties. Okay, the Uniform Commercial Code. Um, I also, by the way, you'll hear pages turning. I have a couple different notebooks in front of me that I'm going to be using to, to get my information for this lecture, so um, you may hear some of that. The Uniform Commercial Code, it's called the Uniform Code, and the reason why it's uniform, it's a comprehensive law that governs transactions, and it was designed and written for the purpose of having all 50 states enacting the exact same law. Think back to our discussion about sources of law, which we're going to come back to actually a couple times in this lecture, um, you know that there is a federal government, there is a legislature at the federal level, Congress, and they're passing federal laws, and there's a state legislature here in Maine. We have Maine um, legislature. In other states, it's called different things. I know in Connecticut, it's called the Connecticut General Assembly. Um, but anyway, they're passing different laws, and remember that um, the Constitution uh, one of the things we mentioned, we talked about the Constitution as a source of law, only grants Congress the ability to pass certain types of laws, only the ability to regulate certain things. All the rest of the things that Congress can't do are reserved to the state legislatures. So since this happens to fall into an area, and we can argue back and forth, and legal scholars do, but since this seems to fall into an area of state concern, the state governments were asked all uniformly, all 50 of them, to enact this comprehensive law governing transactions. Now the goal of it being, um, looking at the common law, it's kind of awkward and clunky. It doesn't make for quick, easy business transactions. You've got all these concerns about offer, acceptance, this needs to happen, that needs to happen. Um, it's very rigid. It doesn't make for lightning fast um, transactional um, business to take place. You have to keep in mind that about the time that this UCC was being drafted, it was in the early um, 20th century where you know we'd already gone through um, an industrial revolution and we were starting to see mass production, assembly line production, things like cars up in, uh, up in Detroit, the Model T. You know, things were happening much, much faster as far as commerce was concerned. And the common the common law rules don't facilitate that that atmosphere of business. So the UCC was really designed to be very business friendly. And I think when I introduced it to you um, earlier in the class, I said every single person in the room has been impacted by the UCC, um, and that was their goal: is to get as much simple, easy transactions, things that are usually technically contracts to get them out of common law, governed by something else that's much more conducive to those types of business transactions. All right. So the UCC has a number of different articles. I believe there's not uh, 10. There's 10 articles because one of them has a, has a sub-article. I'll get to that in a second. Um, and they deal with different aspects of um, trans transacting um, business. Um, some of the articles that are in there include uh, the Article 2A, which concerns leasing goods. Right? So um, this happens a lot in business, if you're, especially if you're starting up a business. If you're starting up a business like a, I think an example I used in the past was a printing press. If you're starting up a printing business and you have to buy um, you know, half a million dollar printing machines to print something like magazines or newspapers, chances are you're not going to have half a million dollars on hand to just fork over. Plus, that machine is probably going to be obsolete um, in a couple years anyway, so why bother purchasing it? There are businesses out there that make a lot of money off of just leasing things like that. As a matter of fact, um, you've probably seen this if you've worked in an office atmosphere in the business machines that you do use, things like copiers um, and printers. You know, why buy a $5,000 um, printer or, and copier when it's going to be obsolete soon when you can just lease it 
pay a smaller amount of money over a smaller amount of time um, and in the end probably get the, the a better product um, a more up-to-date product so that's governed by article 2a of the 2a of the uniform commercial code article 3 um, concerns itself with negotiable paper a uh, negotiable instruments which is something I mentioned um, when I was talking about the topics for your term papers the book spends a lot of time your textbook spends a lot of time with negotiable instruments mostly what they're talking about are checks notes like promissory notes and drafts these are documents used to pay for things especially when you're not dealing with a transaction where somebody walks up to a desk um, asks for something off the shelf and hands over cash or a credit card or something like that we're talking about transactions where a major manufacturing facility in one state is contacting a supplier of raw materials halfway across the country um, and having a huge quantity of them delivered now how are you going to pay for that you're not gonna go there and hand them a cash you're probably gonna send them a check or you're gonna draft a note some kind of um, indication of your indebtedness to them and deliver that to them um, and those the rules on that are governed in article three um, article eight concerns itself with secured transactions, secured interests, um, which has to do basically with how we're going to um, address the uh, indebtedness on um, things that you've purchased. Um, I talked about this briefly too, I think when we were talking about paper topics. Then there's also an article, I believe it's article 7, that deals with um, warehousing and storage of goods that are for sale. Keep in mind, you know, if you're a company like, I don't know, if you're a company that's producing a mass quantity of goods, um, I think of some of the paper mills here in Maine, which may or may not still be operating. You know, if you're producing thousands of pounds of paper a day, you're not going to store that on site. If it's sold already and you have a buyer for it, you're probably going to want to ship it as soon as possible to the buyer, which is fine. But if you don't, you're going to need to warehouse it somewhere. And when someone does buy it, you're going to have to deal with that warehouse and getting and distribution, getting it out to the people who've purchased it. So the rules on that are governed Article 7. So you see, in all of these articles, you have a story that's presented about transacting business and the different um, steps in the transaction. The actual sale of it, which is what we're going to concern ourselves with here, is governed by Article 2. Article 2. Article 3, the negotiable paper, is paying for it. Article 7, we're talking about warehouse and storage. There are articles that deal with um, distribution and delivery, um, although a lot of that is covered in Article 2, and we'll talk about it. And, you know, secured interest for indebtedness for parts of that product that you couldn't afford um, to pay up front, um, of course, is Article um, 9. I think I said 8 before. I think it's 9. Um, anyway, the UCC is the most expansive uniform law ever written and it's one of the only ones that's been enacted in some form at least by all 50 states so it truly is uniform the last state holding out again was Louisiana they're so weird they have this French thing going on they didn't like the uniform commercial code but finally they gave in so all 50 states have some version of the uniform commercial code all right there are some other uniform laws out there the most one of the most significant being um there's a uniform law on uh, child custody um, jurisdiction when you have child custody cases where one parent is in one state another parent is in another state and you have a child living with one of them um, what states courts have jurisdiction over that matter um, is governed by a uniform law so all I think it's it's not all 50 states though that have passed that particular uniform law but it's close I want to say it's maybe 45 or 48 somewhere in there um, there have also been attempts at other uniform laws there was a, an attempt at a uniform uh, criminal code so that the same activities the same actions would be the same crime um, across all 50 states that didn't go over very well um, there are also we'll talk about uh, after our midterm we'll talk about the uniform partnership act uniform uh, limited liabilities uh, limited liability partnership act and other attempts at uniform laws governing formation of um, of business organizations um, again, none of them have been as u as widely accepted as the Uniform Commercial Code, which um, makes it very unique and um, very interesting. Um, okay, 